liberal-fascism.com. Welcome to the Slave Kingdom's edition of Nobody Watches PBS. You ask me whether I approve of violence. Uh, I just, uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. My people are a military people, male and female. My revenue is the proceeds of the sale of prisoners of war. All my nation, all are soldiers, and the slave trade feeds them. <laughs> This is how a powerful West African ruler described his kingdom to a British soldier in the middle of the last century. It's no secret that European traders shipped roughly 11 million Africans to the New World from this very coast. <laughs> My own great-great-grandmother was one of those Africans. Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. In so many ways, the slave trade has shaped what America is and who I am. There are two things that have always haunted me. The brutality of the European traders and the stories I've heard about Africans selling other Africans into slavery. The slave kingdoms. I've come to Ghana, to the town of Elmina, to find out what really happened along this coast. This was the first European slave trading post in all of sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, it feels very Mediterranean here. You can certainly feel the influence of the Portuguese and the Spanish. 500 years ago, the Portuguese came here searching for gold but they found a far more valuable commodity, human beings. They also found powerful kingdoms whose rulers were happy to trade. Elmina was already a thriving market town, but it grew dramatically with the slave trade. From Elmina, I'm heading inland, away from the coast and the European slave ports to Kumasi the capital of the Kingdom of Ashanti. From there, I'll travel east on the trail of the notorious kings of Dahomey. Then I'll make my way back to the coast, to Ouida, to the most infamous slave port of them all. Ouida saw the last slave ship leave West Africa, hardly more than a century ago. I'm typical of African Americans of my generation. I'm obsessed with tracing my roots. For 200 years, many of my people had fantasies about coming back to Africa to live. Some actually did. We feel at home here because we're surrounded by black people. That's why we come. But the memory of slavery and of what our ancestors must have gone through is always lurking. Even a pretty little harbor town like Elmina is dominated by its slave castle. And for us, a slave castle is like Auschwitz. Right in here. This very dungeon housed between 150 and 200 women for three good months. This is where they slept, yes. But the place was much overcrowded. So there wasn't enough space for one even to lie down. The result was an outbreak of malaria and yellow fever. So by the time the ships arrived, more than half were already dead. Well, this is the infamous room of no return. That is also the door of no 
never turned. Why just left God here? They never knew where they were going. Neither did they know what was going to happen to them. All they knew was to get out of this room onto the boat. Some actually committed suicide. Because that was the only way they thought they could get their freedom. In fact, it was the Africans who did the raiding and selling of Africans to the Europeans. No European ever went into the hinterland to raid for slaves. It was the Africans who did it. And bef be before the Europeans even landed here, slavery was already in the system. It was slaves that worked in the palaces. I thought it was more, even at that time, than just money. It had to be just some, just something else that drove them to just kill these people. Yeah, why brutalize them like that? Why brutalize? Them? But then again, I guess that's that's justification, the rationalization. If you brutalize it, then you have to say to yourself, there's no way we as a Christian people could brutalize other humans so they can't be humans. But did it surprise you when you found out that Africans were involved as well as middlemen? Um, the thing, I, I knew that Africans were involved. I didn't know the extent to what they were involved. And I also didn't know that once they found out what was going on here, and, and I know that they had to know what was going on here, that they stayed a willing participant in it. That, that's the crazy part of it. I think I was surprised and hurt and angry and everything because, you know, these were people that, you know, you know I sort of had a fantasy about them and, and as our ancestors and your ancestors don't sell you. So that fantasy was sort of <laughs> blown away. And I, I was, I was uh, yeah, I, I had a, a, a whole range of thoughts. This isn't my first visit to a slave castle. But it is the first time I've heard a tour guide be so explicit about the role of the Africans. Most of us come here to beat up on the Europeans, and God knows they deserve it. I'm actually surprised at how honest he was. Dr. Akosua Purby teaches African history and is specialized in the slave trade. The Europeans came to Africa in the 15th century. And when they arrived, they found a well-knit political system in Africa. A well-made political system? Yes, well-knit political system. In other words, they were centralized it with kings, chiefs, well-established political systems. They also found that there was a well-established economic system in terms of trading and so on. And so they recognized who the Africans were. And it was they found strong states, kings who were ready to negotiate with them on equal basis and partnership basis, hmm. both in their trade and so on. And in fact, when the Europeans started building their forts and castles, they asked permission from the kings to build their land, to build their forts, and then they paid rent for their forts. So they needed, as it were, the Africans to agree on equal basis or partnership basis to enslave their fellow Africans. So if Africans had not sold other Africans to the Europeans, there wouldn't have been a slave trade? I think so. Because the Africans were strong enough if they had said no Perhaps the Europeans themselves would have tried to go inland, and that would have been very, very difficult. When I come to Africa, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? What would my life be like if my ancestors hadn't been enslaved? Mm -hmm. What would I be? Maybe you would have been a chief in Asante Mampong. <laughs> <laughs> I like being chief. Yeah, uh, you're a chief, and people have called you Nana, Nana, <laughs> Nana, Bre, Bre, Nana, Bre, Bre, Nana, Bre. <laughs> It's a nice idea, but if my ancestors had been chiefs, it's not very likely that they would have ended up in chains on a slave ship. It's more likely that they'd have been selling slaves and buying guns. Since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. I've been so welcomed here. I almost wanted to forget about Ashanti's role in the slave trade, but I can't. The Ashanti sold the Europeans prisoners of war and their own criminals. 
a large part of their wealth and glory was based on slavery. I wanted to know if they had any regrets. So I asked the king's son, Ohiniba Adawese Poku. The whole slavery episode was an unfortunate era in the history of Africa, and for that matter, of Ashanti. One would say it depleted the human resources mm -hmm. of the empire, you know, what perhaps uh, the empire could have achieved you know, was lost through this trade, you know. So, much as uh, we, as I said, do regret, you know, that era in our history, you know, perhaps it was a sign of the times, and uh, mm. we couldn't have done otherwise. But do you think the Africans understood how horrible the transatlantic slave trade was? No, 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 no. I mean, you know, I don't think they knew. I mean, if they had known, you know, uh, known about the horrible stories that these our brothers and sisters were going through when they were being transported, not only from our coast, but through the transatlantic, uh, through Gori, and then the transatlantic route to the States. Uh, I don't think they would have continued doing it. You know, I mean, besides, there was no means of knowing, you know, mm. the you know, brutalities that um, they underwent. Mm. Perhaps the people around the castles might have seen yes, how horrible it was. they might have seen some aspect of it, but um, those of us, that's us, that's us who were in the interior, mm. you know, had no means of knowing, mm. you know, except through a few stories here and there. You know, but if they had known, I'm sure that they wouldn't have continued doing it. Mm. It's hard to, to turn down such a huge source of profit. You know the motivation of human beings. Well, that's the, that's the human factor in trading, the profitability of it. Mm. But uh, it happened, and I think most people are very sorry that it did happen you know, mm. that way. Yes. Especially the slaves. And well, I hope so. Mm. Yes. Yes. It's not surprising that he should want to explain away this nightmare in our history. The truth is, like everyone else in this business, the Ashanti were motivated by profit. Since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. At last I made it into Benin, the modern name of Dahomey. Stories about human sacrifice and barbarism here were favorite traveler's tales in the 18th century. Traders were far more fearful of Dahomey's kings than they were of Ashanti's. The kingdom expanded rapidly in the 1700s, conquering all who stood in its way. Many people took refuge in isolated places. At the end of the last century, the royal court covered 100 acres, and 10,000 people lived inside its walls. Today, the palaces are being restored by Joseph Adande. The kings of Dahomey traded a lot of slaves. Abome has traded from the figures we know now, not far from one million people. Just slaves? Just from Abome alone? Just from Abome alone. And you have more from the neighboring kingdoms, uh, Savi Kingdom, for instance, Port Novo Kingdom, etc., uh, etc. Et all the way all down to Lagos in Nigeria. Yes, mm. all the way to Lagos in Nigeria. And the columns you can see here are the sign of the slave trade because they would buy a cannon against 25 gentlemen. Do the citizens of Benin today, through the schools or publicly, talk about this history of the slave trade when? the people of Dahomey sold other black people to the white man and then shipped them to the New World. We do not talk much about slave, slave trade, slavery, because for most of Beninese people, 300 years back is a lot. Mm. Those who have been to school know about slave trade, know about uh, what happened to their brothers sold to uh, the New World. And a few months back, we had the bicentenary of the death of King Agonglo. Mm -hmm. And Agonglo was said to be one of the kings who tried to stop slave trade. Ah, but so, of course, he did not succeed. But he must have known how bad it was. 
Yes, he knew. They knew how bad it was. That was why they didn't treat their own people. Mm -hmm. They would treat people from the wars and battles they did all around the country. Well, there's no attempt to explain away anything here. This recently restored artwork on the palace walls tells the whole story. The kings of Dahomey carried a lot of war. There was almost every, every year a war. This image again shows you that we are dealing with Yoruba people because you can see the scars, scars on their faces. And this gentleman has been beheaded again because, uh, well, he lost. But there's so many images on these panels yes. of violence, of conquering. Yes. Was it a particularly violent kingdom? Well, people say and pretend that it is a particularly violent kingdom, but I have not seen throughout history any conqueror not being violent. Have you ever come across someone who is conquering and is not violent? No, generally people conquer by violence. <laughs> okay, so sure. that's uh, this kingdom that did, of course, cultivate the art of superiority, and each king had to train his son to be a warrior, to be someone who is uh, greedy of power, of expanding all over. Hmm. What's this low building over here? This is the building King Lele erected in memory of his ancestors, both male and female. In memory of his ancestors? Yes. And you see, you have to bend down before entering this place because you have to show respect. Mm. Instead of kneeling, you have to bend down deeply. It's like a tomb, but nobody has been buried here. Mm. Those walls are made of mud, of course, some gold powder, rum, probably some palm oil, then some blood. And blood? Yes. What, animal blood? Well, there's certainly some animal blood, and uh, probably there was... It is said that there is some human blood into the walls. Human blood? Yes. Were people sacrificed? Yes, people were sacrificed, but it's not any slave who is sacrificed. Hmm. A king from another place is always sacrificed. The head of the army is always sacrificed. Rivals. Rivals, yes. Mighty rivals are always sacrificed. The king still wears the royal nose piece. It's meant to make him look like a leopard. But it's also a royal air filter. The king must breathe cleaner air than the rest of us. Do I bow? I want to talk to him about the slave trade but for some reason, I feel more awkward about it than I did in Ashanti. Uh -huh. You tell him my great, great, great grandmother came from the west coast of Africa. He's very happy to see his friend, his son who has gone to London or America uh -huh. to be today a very important personality Tell and he returned to home. Uh, you see. Thank you. Thank you. Almost 20 percent of all the slaves that came to the New World came from the Bight of Benin, from this very region. And the slave trade here was run by the kings of Dahomey run far longer than any other aspect of the slave trade, all the way to 1885. So they knew what they were doing. So for me to go to the court of the king of Dahomey, as nice as the people are here, and as much as I enjoyed it, was, for the descendant of one of those slaves, an unsettling experience. Since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa, I've really come to Ouida on the trail of its most infamous slave trader, Don Francisco de Souza. De Souza was a Brazilian appointed by the king of Dahomey to run his slave business in the early 19th century. He was given the title Viceroy of Ouida. As the only non-African on the African side of the trade, Don Francisco has fascinated both novelists and historians. In a world that was turning against slavery, he was an anachronism, but a very rich anachronism. 
you. <laughs> Martin is a direct descendant of Don Francisco. The family owns a whole section of Ouida, and only his descendants live here. So this is all the family compound through yeah, here? Yeah, this is all the family compounds here. Hmm. And how many people live here? Ooh, about 3,000 of people. 3,000? Yeah, about 2,000 of people. 2,000? Two. Gee, that's a big family. Yeah. It's a big house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how do you <laughs> have breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Were you born here? Yes, I was born here hmm. in 1954. Don Francisco fathered 99 sons, and no one knows how many daughters. They were the aristocracy of Ouida, and they still are. Tell me about your ancestors. Martin took me to see Prosper de Souza, a senior member of the family. I asked him how he felt about Don Francisco. Mm -hmm. He loved African women. He had a lot of wives, African wives. Mm. How many? I don't know the number. I don't know how many. Je suis fier de ce qu'il a fait. I am proud of what he did. Because he saved the life of many people. Mm. Because he saved the life of many people. Because he saved the life of many people. Because he saved the life of many people. According to me, he saved the life of many people. Thousands of people. Mm -hmm. The king of Abume would have sacrificed all of them. Mm. So he has done a good thing by sending them away from the country. That's right. But the bad thing is that the slaves in the New World have a hole in their heart. Mais ce qui est mauvais, c'est que tous ces descendants d'esclaves qui sont là-bas ont un grand vide, un grand trou dans leur cœur. Oui, c'est que ils ont la nostalgie de leur ville, peut-être. Ils veulent revoir leur patrie d'antan. They have a nostalgia of their country. They would like to come back and see mm -hmm. their country mm -hmm. as it was before. I doubt that Don Francisco was motivated by saving people from sacrifice, but it's obviously a comforting family legend. Don Francisco's bedroom has been kept as a shrine. You mean he lived here? Yeah, he lived here. <laughs> He was even buried in his bedroom. In his bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd like that. <laughs> I mean, this is it? Yeah, this is the grave. When he died, they buried him here? Yes, they buried him here. So he was the king of slavery? Yeah, he was. <laughs> I cannot say the king of the slavery, but the king of, you know, Wida. The king of Wida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was very important in the slave trade. I am not proud of him because, you know, the slave trade was terrible. And that sent from out from Africa a lot of descendants, you know. So it's evil business. I didn't like it at all. Mm. I wish I was descendant from slaves. That would, be, that would make me feel better. Yeah. And, you know, I always feel uh, guilty when I meet, you know, African-Americans. And, you know, because my, uh, my position is uh, delicate, you know. At the, I am part of the history, and at the same time, I will be telling the story, the history. You know, it makes me all the time feel bad. Hmm. Yeah. And many African Americans would rather have been yes, in, kept here yeah, rather than yeah. taken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't tell everybody that I'm descendant of, you know, the Sousa. Hmm. I'll tell them that. Um, Guvidi, not the Souza. Do <laughs> they get angry? Name. Do they get angry? Yeah, some of them. Yeah, and you know how? If you were at my place, how would you feel? You know, when you tell the story to somebody who would start crying, mm. and I know from, you know, inside of me that I'm part of the history. It's very sad. But it's not your fault. It's not my fault, but that's how it is. Mm. <laughs> I feel sorry for Martine. I had never thought about the devastating impact that slavery has on the descendants of the traitors. But I don't believe that you inherit the sins of your ancestors. I almost feel guilty dragging it out of her. Martine and I walked down Weta's infamous slave road. The slaves were marched from the market to the ships waiting offshore. So Don Francisco carved this 
route straight down to the sea? Yes, straight down to the sea. The slaves will be in chains? Yeah, they will all be in chains and walk these roads. This place is Zomayi. There was a dark room here, and those who will not go the same day will be kept here for mm. many months while waiting for the boats. Oh, I see. And uh, they'll feed them once a day, only when it's dark, because they will not see light to recognize where they are staying. It's just to keep them from running away mm. and to make them get used to the life in the boat. So they would go to the bathroom yeah. here, they eat here. Yeah, everything here. You know, there were uh, no more human beings. They were treated like animals. Mm, worse. Worse than animals. Mm. Yeah. This is the last stop of the slaves. Actually, we call that monument the gate of no return. No return. So once they cross this gate, it's finished. The destination is uh, the new world. You ask me whether I approve of violence. Uh, I just, uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa.